We're back on Think Tech. It's 5 p.m. on a given Wednesday. We have Russell Kekoa Kohler uh, in Washington, D.C. joins us by Skype to talk about the, uh, the turmoil in Turkey. Welcome again to the show, Russell. Nice to have you. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be here. Well, the news around here the, today was uh, the death of Mark Takai, Congressman Mark Takai. I'm sure you knew him. He was there with you in Washington. And he was a really good guy. I think everyone liked him. Um, he was he was close to think tech. He'd been on our shows a number of times, both before and after he was elected um, to the House, and most recently on March 11th when he came around. That was after he had announced uh, his pancreatic cancer, and so uh, we feel very close to him and very sorry for his passing. He was uh, dedicated to the country, dedicated to public service, did a lot for the state and for the country. I I, I feel bad about his uh, passing. You knew him. What what are your thoughts about this? You know, it's it was a shock to us all. Uh, I myself worked for uh, as a in an internship capacity, Senator Brian Schatz, and and it, it was a it was a shock to all the staff. We did not think that the his his cancer would progress that that quickly. I know a bunch of I you know we all know a, a lot of his staff. Uh, we know them very closely, and so it's really heartbreaking to see um, such a young and up and coming. Uh, politician, especially from Hawaii, coming out of the, the real um, promising class of, of young politicians, of, which include Senator Schatz, uh, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, and, and Mark Takai. Um, and, and to be honest, he, he was the perfect person that you wanted as you know, a congressman representing you, a good all-around person with a, with a nice, healthy family no scandals, uh, veteran, yeah. and somebody who actually cared about doing the job. So our hearts like go really out. Our hearts go out to his exactly. family, uh, to the, the people around him. Um, too bad we lost him. It was too early. Uh, our condolences. In any event, uh, Russell, let's talk about what happened in Turkey. Uh, it was only a few days ago, and uh, Mr. Erdogan uh, has survived and the, the, we need to know the circumstances and the inner workings and hidden mechanisms of what appears to be an attempted coup. Some have suggested that it was a put-up coup. Uh, so what do we know about it? Well, the first adjective you gave uh, President Erdogan is quite adept. Uh, he is a survivor. That's what, that's what he's done throughout his entire political career from when he was thrown in jail by the uh, Kemalists before he was in office to now having survived, uh, survived this uh, potential military uprising. Um, from what we know now, it, it seems like the government is not only in control, but is actively pursuing a, a campaign of purging the rest of uh, President Erdogan's political enemies throughout the country, which include the military as well as even in, in uh, the education sector, uh, the police, uh, as well as throughout the country and in the, the universities. Um, it was unpredictable to most, if not all, analysts, scholars, people who follow Turkey. We had actually believed uh, truly that a military coup in Turkey was, uh, was as probable as a war between Germany and France. Uh, it was, uh, we had thought that the president, President Erdogan, had... Uh, significantly lessened the, p the political power of the military throughout his tenure and um, the military had fallen in line um, as it were uh, with the AKP and the, the governing structure. Um, so when everything did start off at, at 7.30 Friday night, uh, Istanbul time, uh, you can imagine world leaders, not only myself, but every world leader uh, was uh, glued to their television sets and uh, especially getting uh, the right amount of information in their ear. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that, so there's a bunch of things to, uh, to talk about here. Uh, you say that uh, it, was, it, was, it was not seen coming, and yet, um, gee whiz, uh, they, they uh, try to do a coup on him. Um, and what, why? I mean, what, was, what were they so concerned about? What was the disenchantment that led to the coup? And 
before I before I start, I, I do have to have a, a, a somewhat of a disclaimer. I do understand that Turkey has had four previous military coups throughout its history, but this in, in these current political conditions in this era of, of 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 the status of the Turkish military, this was quite un- unprecedented. Uh, um, and even with the uh, with the occurrences in Turkey's past and. Uh, in, this, in the 1960s, 1970s, and the, um, the last major coup in 1980, and the last sort of uh, military political uprising in, in the 90s, uh, this was definitely a, a different situation. It looked like that uh, the, there were some nationalist, Kemalist sections of the uh, Turkish military that uh, really had gotten to the point where they had had enough with with President Erdogan's tenure in in office. He, according to them, he had significantly eroded the rule of law, the constitutional structure, and the uh, role of secularism, uh, traditional role of secularism in the Turkish Republic. Uh, now, this is a simple way of explaining it. It's it's much more complicated, um, and there are many layers to this. Uh, to this uh, event, um, but I, I'd love to delve into into it a bit. Well, it sounds like a continuation of the um, the riots that took place what three four years ago in Taksim Park in Istanbul, uh, where I, I think um, you can correct me, but uh, that was really essentially telling him that uh, he should remain secular because he was moving off secular. Uh, and the, the country is balanced because it is set. ever since uh, Ataturk in the 1920s, the modern Western, if you will, Western nation, and uh, Mr. Erdogan has been moving, you know, maybe away from that. Uh, so, is this the same kind of thread happening now? You, one could say that. One could say that. You could say that the political and civil, and as well as social instability that had come out of the Gezi Park protests, out of the, uh, to the December 2013 corruption scandal uh, uprisings. That this was uh, the military coup was a uh, really a climax of, of all of those uh, symptoms um, leading up to, uh, and so uh, and this can even we can even uh, you know postulate that that the current uh, war against the PKK as well as uh, the war against ISIS also factors into the decision making of these military commanders. Because what was interesting and unprecedented with this specific military coup uh, is that the Turkish general staff, the, the top generals, basically our chief of staff, uh, if we were to compare, they had no part uh, in the Turkish, uh, the, the military coup's planning or plotting. Uh, and so every coup in Turkey beforehand had been planned and executed by the Turkish general staff and had been led legitimately through these top military commanders. Uh, this current military coup that happened over the weekend uh, was done by division commanders, uh, base commanders that had banded together, organized, and had sought to uh, sort of get a, uh, have a bandwagon effect as uh, try to control the message, take control of the most important cities, and have other units throughout the country fall in line behind them. Uh, unfortunately for them, uh, it, it didn't happen uh, as well, or it wasn't executed as well as they, they had hoped. And, uh, did the general uh, staff participate? Easily. Did the general staff go along? Did the general staff resist uh, to try to stop them? So that one uh, interesting aspect of this particular coup is that the chief of, uh, the, chief of the general staff of the Turkish military, so the top general of the, of the Turkish military, he had actually been taken hostage uh, within an hour of uh, of the events that had unfolded, mm-hmm. and he was actually forced upon gunpoint to declare the uh, the military coup over over broadcasting networks. So it seems like the general staff had either uh, there was no resistance. It looks like physical resistance, but they had not gone along with the plan or nor supported it. Well, they got, they, they got a certain you know, distance in, right? Um, it was not completely, at the outset, 
uh, they made some traction on this and took over the media, as I recall. Uh, how far did they get before they were stopped, and how did he stop them? Yes, uh, it looks like their main objectives were taking control of the two largest cities in Turkey, uh, Istanbul, of course, and Ankara, the, the uh, nation's capital, which is, makes sense. You want to take control of the government. Um, and their secondary objectives were the broadcasting centers, uh, TRT, which is the state-run uh, media organization, uh, CNN Turk, uh, along with a number of smaller broadcasting networks. Uh, in Istanbul, they were able to take uh, both of the bridge, take control of both of the bridges, uh, the Bosphorus bridges, uh, pretty quickly. Um, but unfortunately, uh, what they had not counted on was the heavy resistance that they would have that they would face. Um, by municipal police, as well as the police forces and police commanders that were uh, that remained loyal to President Erdogan and the, and the, the Turkish government, and so uh, what we saw was a a coup that had executed its primary and secondary objectives quickly, uh, but had not expanded beyond there, and and it seems like they had not. Um, according to a, a couple analysts um, on this on this subject, they had not they, they did not truly understand how to control the message throughout the country. Uh, the one thing, the biggest mistake that uh, that they had uh, they had done was uh, not sh uh, controlling social media, uh, not controlling the internet, uh, whether that be cutting it off or at least controlling the the airwaves. Uh, yeah, they should have been uh, very Akamai about that because, in fact, that's been a big feature in Turkish politics. And uh, Mr. Erdogan has um, used social media to his advantage for a long time. Absolutely. And, and it's quite ironic, actually, because you know, during the Gezi Park protest, which you had seen, I had seen myself, uh, he had had the exact opposite reaction to the use of social media. In those specific occurrences, he found social media to be the enemy, where um, he had uh, pursued legal proceedings and had actually had laws passed allowing the state to ban cer certain social media sites during a period of crisis. What that crisis is, it's dependent upon the president or the prime minister. Um, in, this, in the coup, however, the president was handicapped because he was outside of the uh, continental Turkey, I suppose. He was, he was outside of the country in, in a, on an island called Marmaris and, um, on vacation, and he had no ability to get on TV uh, within the country. And so he had actually used FaceTime on his phone <laughs> in order to call out to his supporters <laughs> to not only resist the coup, but to flood the streets and, and fight for your democracy. Now, for a man that has utilized repression, <laughs> jailed, jailed anyone with, with, with opinions of dissent, has one of the worst records of independent journalists and investigative journalists, to have that amount of, of, of hypocrisy is, is quite amazing, uh, actually. That's, that's really interesting. But he work, it works to his, uh, his favor. Uh, you know, the big lie, effectively. He made some traction and, and stopped them. And when we Absolutely. come back from this break, Russell, uh, I want to talk about uh, how bloodless this coup was, or maybe wasn't. I know that 250 people died, but let's talk about how that happened. We'll be right back. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? He's really, he's the ultimate chutzpah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, and there are, there are more things that I, I was... Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. 
Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. We're back. We're live with Russell Kekoa Kohler in Washington, D.C., in the Hart Office building there. And uh, here's uh, Think Tech Global talking about the turmoil in Turkey uh, over that recent coup. So, yeah, the, the coup is really interesting, the way the tide turns um, almost immediately and the way Erdogan takes control of it using social media. But then some people died. What happened? Well, it looks like most of, uh, you know, and it's unfortunate when any death occurs, especially when it is a nation fighting itself. Um, it looks like most of the deaths occurred in, in a number of different operations in which the, the military coup plotters had been assaulting uh, an arrangement of palaces, government offices, fighting against municipal police officers and military police officers, as well as when, um, finally, when the tide did turn in the government's favor, um, those subsequent operations by government supporters um, uh, executing operations against the coup plotters. Uh, there were a number of civilian deaths, uh, most significantly. Uh, there was uh, an incident on one of the Bosphorus bridges where a, uh, after the president had called his supporters out to the streets and to fight for their democracy, they had confronted the soldiers uh, unarmed with Turkish flags, uh, shouting, you know, you know, we fight for democracy, Allahu Akbar, uh, a number, a range of uh, different things. And um, in one instance, the soldiers did open fire on, onto the crowd. Um, it looks like the death toll has stayed under 300, which is very, very fortunate, especially during a military coup. Um, but it looks like around 1,500 people were injured uh, throughout the, uh, the proceedings. Yeah, that's troublesome in the sense that, uh, you know, back uh, in the days of Taksim Square, uh, the soldiers and the police were uh, fighting people, but they were not using real bullets. They were using rubber bullets and uh, batons and gas, but not real bullets. Uh, there were very limited casualties because of that. When you start firing into a crowd, you're, you will kill people. And that was really, uh, you're right, you're, the point uh, that th these were their own countrymen. Gee, uh, that's, that's pretty bad. So, okay, so now he's able to take over. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, some, some commentators have suggested that he, he set this up himself, that this was a, a ruse in order to uh, get into a position uh, where he could deal with people he considered his enemies and be repressive, you know, to justify repression. Uh, is there, you think there's any truth to that? You know, I've heard this, uh, this theory uh, actually quite often, uh, whether that be on Facebook or through Turkish friends or a friend that I'd, I just talked to uh, a couple of days ago over the weekend. Um, and, you know, uh, simply, uh, for me, that's just giving too much credit to a man that has really relied on instincts and adaptab uh, adaptability and having a, survival, uh, a survivor's mentality uh, to really plan and execute uh, something like this to this scale. Uh, for me, when I look at Erdogan, President Erdogan's uh, political career, it, it sort of looks like a, a large high and low period. He gets to a point where he seems you know, fairly overconfident. He seems like he thinks to himself the country is in his control, all of the mechanisms he's you know, wheeling and dealing, and then a period of civil unrest, social instability, something he can't control. And then he reacts. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing happens. After the Gezi Park protests were completely crushed, another period of overconfidence, he feels like the country is his again, and then December hits, corruption scandal, a period of love. Survives that, completely crushes his political enemies and the so-called FETO organization, the Gulenist organization, which he's blaming for this coup as well, and he feels, feels like he's in a period of overconfidence, and then the war with the PKK and the terrorist attacks uh, by ISIS. And so what I see is a, is a man that uh, really relies on, on the moment and utilizing these moments to his advantage. 
I don't think he is. I don't believe personally that he he was able to plan and execute this specific Mm -hmm. coup. Mm -hmm. However, what I can confidently say is that he will use the outcome to significantly consolidate power within Turkey and make sure that this never happens again. Uh, And so where we go from here, where the country goes from here, I'm, I'm not particularly sure, but I do know that it will be a, it will have a much darker shade of authoritarianism. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, um, I just, I wonder, um, you know, how people feel about it because repression uh, is not a good thing. Here is, this has been a democracy, although as you say, it's had its ups and downs. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, whether his repression is going to make it less of a democracy and more of a, a, a strong man rule. I mean, they call him a strong man. Um, uh, and, and how people feel about that. Any thoughts? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the, probably the most fascinating aspect of, of a President Erdogan and looking back on his uh, almost 13 years in power now, uh, is the fact that he he doesn't it, it looks like he's he isn't repulsed by democracy uh, he actually has utilized democracy in order to uh, in, in really limit liberty that's really what it is uh, Turkey is an illiberal democracy uh, which has elections that are free but unfair uh, if that makes if that, if that makes any sense uh, uh, he's somebody that will always utilize the will of the people, of course, his supporters, um, in order to continue his political mandate throughout the country. And so what that forces him to have to do is really look to uh, inhibiting the power of his political opponents um, through really any means possible. And a lot of times what he's able to legitimate you know, all of these policies with is one single unifying factor. And that's unfortunately what we've seen is religion. Um, even during the coup, and this is probably, um, we spoke a little bit about this in, in break, but uh, I was, I had the opportunity to uh, be in good contact with my friends in Turkey as the coup was occurring. Oh. And a very good friend of mine uh, had said that the mosques throughout Istanbul, where she was, had been blaring uh, for hours, nonstop. Um, whether it be the call to prayer, usually it's five times a day, the call to prayers um, heard throughout the city. But in this case, they had actually been, the imams had actually been calling for people to rise out of their houses, rise out of their where they were, and fight for their democracy. This is a this is a struggle that you need to fight for. And so, really, the government, the elected government of Turkey, President Erdogan, has significantly. And I'm not sure. Maybe this is part of the pieces of where uh, he really has infiltrated and really eroded the separation of religion and state in Turkey. But if you have a a you know a unifying uh, a, a unifying factor, a legitimizing factor, such as uh, religion, uh, behind you, uh, you can really get a movement going. And In Turkey, it seems especially, like, yeah, absolutely. And it seems like most of the people that had actually been called out and rose up against the uh, the military coup plotters were were Erdogan supporters, but yeah. also were influenced by the fact that. The mosques had been enticing people to go, demanding people go out. Well, it sounds like it. things are not only swinging to a repression, but they're swinging to religion, <clears throat> which is what, you know, the problem has been. He's swinging in that direction, and he relied on support from the religious end of things in order to beat back the coup. Does it? Abs- so absolutely. we're going to have a more religious Turkey now. What, what, we will, what we will see and what we have seen is President Erdogan create and hold these specific alliances within the, um, the politics of Turkey. And one of those 
is that which is now becoming more and more apparent is the uh, the religious class uh, within within Turkey, and it looks like he has been able to, you know, at least for them, be the guy that they would rather have in power than anybody else. Yeah. And so, it, what we will see is a Turkey that may be more religious, as long as it serves President Erdogan's interests. <laughs> that is that is the big difference. Well, he comes out pretty good on this. He beat them back. It didn't have to happen that way. Um, he and gave him the opportunity to cleanse his uh, his army of anyone who might oppose him, um, and it gave him an opportunity to you know put his uh, political rivals out of commission too. At the end of the day, uh, I think it's clear. At, oh, and he's s sort of surfaced this the, the whole support system in the religious end of Turkey. So at the end of the day, it seems to me that he's more powerful. Uh, than he was a week ago, and Absolutely. more likely to, you know, and probably more popular. Don't you think more popular as well? Certainly. I mean, people, uh, you know, unfortunately, people love winners, and he is a survivor. He wins, um, and whether or not his winning is bad for the country going forward, which it is, um, his supporters will will support him more. And more people, you know, young people who are starting to grow up within this political system, uh, may turn to him as really the only choice. Yeah. Um, well, let's you know, let's look. We only have a couple of minutes left, Russell. And I, I wanted to ask you about the you know the uh, the, the larger implications, uh, you know, in that region, the implications for dealing with terrorism, dealing with ISIS, um, and Turkey. You know, I always say Turkey's a capstone there. It has a certain moderating effect on the Middle East. Um, this, this isn't moderate what happened and what's happening. And I, this is a hard question now, but how is this coup going to affect Turkey's ability to deal with terrorism? And how is it going to affect Turkey's position uh, politically, geo, geopolitically in the region? Well, it really could go both ways because this coup could allow, could allow, and this is one of the scenarios, I don't necessarily agree with this, but it could allow um, Erdogan to significantly uh, reduce the amount of opponents within that he has within the Turkish military, uh, within the bureaucracy, to allow him to more effectively uh, execute what he wants to do, whether that is going after ISIS a little bit harder, going after PKK a little bit more significantly, we'll see. But along my own personal opinion, I believe that this provides a real issue here um, with regards to Turkey's ability to not only combat terrorism, um, but to, to accomplish what it, what it really wanted through its ambitions, which was to become a, not only a regional player, but a global player. Uh, and the fact that you are fighting with yourself militarily uh, doesn't bode well. I mean, yeah. just, just today, uh, there have been over 35,000 security officials purged out of the military, the police, as well as the other security um, bureaucracy. 99 of 356 gen Turkish generals have been detained. And so this is where you can see really the real issues that not only the Turkish military, but going forward, Turkish security as a whole is going to have to deal with. Very troubling, very troubling. Well, thank you, Russell. Russell K. Kola Kohler. Uh, on the turmoil in Turkey, joining us by Skype from Washington. Uh, we'll check back with you, I am sure, for a moral certainty, Russell, on more from Turkey and more from you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Jay. Glad to be here again. Aloha. Aloha.